This time on Fifth Gear, Johnny and I try to accomplish the impossible. To find a brand new car for just £10,000 that we actually rate. I'm finding this quite taxing. It's a tall order and we'll be testing them to the limits to find out which is the best. <laughs> we got some air. Vicky doesn't have the same budget constraints as she checks out the ultimate school run Chelsea tractor. The new 165 grand Lamborghini Urus. Wicked. And as you'd expect, Lambo have a unique take on the luxury SUV. No other SUV looks like this. The team get their hands on the biggest BMW ever made. At over five metres long, the X7 aims to be a premium rival to the Range Rover, but its looks may divide opinion. Come, come, come and have a look at this, because I'm, I'm, I don't know if I can take it. I'll be getting the stopwatch out for a space race between two estate cars boasting sporty credentials, the Skoda Superb Sportline and the Volvo V90 T5. It's pretty good, actually. And Jimmy will be looking at a modern icon, the Honda NSX. What a car! And the revolutionary VTEC engine that made it an absolute belter and went on to influence our everyday drives. When that VTEC kicks in, this thing just comes alive. On average, us Brits spend around 22 grand when buying a new car. But we wondered if it was possible to find a new car for less than half that price that was practical, well-designed, but was still fun to drive. So we've assembled these six. All cost around 10 grand and all come with decent manufacturer warranties. For most people, that is reason enough to get their checkbooks out instantly or a more modern method of payment. But if you're petrol heads like us two, you're gonna want more. Now they're going to be cars that we're going to want to spend every single day in. I can't see it. Try before you buy. Come on, let's get in this bad boy. It's clear Jason already has reservations, while I'm a bit more optimistic. So to find out if these cars are all just bargain basement plain Janes, or some are possibly fancy Nancy, we've lined up three challenges. Starting with a sort of quick test drive you might take at a dealership, because any car worth its salt should make a good impression in just a couple of minutes. Our mission is to eliminate at least two cars. We're kicking off with a quick loop in the VW Up. Prices for the up start at £10,370, and for that you get a 60 horsepower, one litre, three cylinder engine that will deliver 54 mpg. So this is like speed dating, isn't it? And straight away, I was in for a surprise. I was expecting 10 grand cars to be tinny and rattly and nasty, and actually, yeah. this is all right, isn't it? It's really all right. Yeah, brakes are good, gearbox is good, the chassis of this car is lovely. It's hard to dislike it. Big up the up. So the little VW kicks off our 10K challenge in fine style. Next for our brief test drive, the Toyota iGo. Prices start at £9,700 and it manages slightly better fuel consumption than the up at 57 mpg. So my go at speed dating. Your go at the iGo. 998cc triple, just one cc down on the VW up. Same torque, 95 Newton metres. Woo! <laughs> it's all right! <laughs> <laughs> Steering's responsive, the brakes are good, it's comfortable. It's relatively quiet. I like it. On to the next car. Moving on rapidly, our third car is the Fiat Panda. In this instance, we've been given the slightly more expensive cross model. However, prices for the entry-level pop version, which comes with an identical engine, starts at 9,970 quid. I love pandas. What, actual pandas? Yeah, yeah, I think I love them. <laughs> <laughs> but would we love the metal one as much as the furry type? It's very noisy, isn't it? It is quite loud. There's a lot of suspension noise coming up. The Panda may have a grown-up four-cylinder 1.2-litre engine under the bonnet, but we weren't convinced it had long-term relationship potential. Do you want a second date it? It's more rough and ready than up an I go. On to the cheapest in our lineup, the Sandero by Dacia, who are part of the Renault Group. So it's a one-litre engine, five-speed, you can't buy a six-speed Dacia. So they use bits of older Renaults. Oh, I can see it. It's everywhere. You can feel the difference in quality compared to the other ones. The steering's quite 
crashy, every little bump it jolts. The seats are not giving me a great deal of support. It's noisy. Oh dear. Next, it's time to hop into a budget offering from Korea. Kia Picanto. £9,895. Oh, that's a that's a nice gear shift, that is. Is it? Yeah. What, like... Yeah. This has a seven-year warranty. Some people just buy Kias because of that. Brake pedal's nice and tight, which I quite like. It's, it's all right, isn't it? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no way, is it really? <laughs> it's actually a really enjoyable car. So, on to the last car of our bunch, the all-new MG3. 1.5 engine, four pot, 108 mile an hour top speed. That's it's good. substantially more nippy than the others by a good chunk. Yeah. Significantly faster, significantly worse emissions. It's also the least fuel efficient of our group at 42 mpg, and surely that matters if you're on a tight budget. Do you know what? <laughs> it is all right, actually. It feels like it's, it's more than a 10 grand car. Yeah. At the end of our speed dating, most of these budget motors have been a pleasant surprise. The challenge is deciding which ones get a second date and which ones get dumped. I'm finding this quite taxing. Right, OK. We like the Igo, we like the Up, we like the Picanto. And agreed that the Panda, because it's harsh as hell, that's got to go. Which leads us on to Dacia MG. This, for me, has to go next to the Dacia. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it. I mean, I like the fact that it's double cheap, but it's yeah. just, it's not in the same league. So I'm, I want to skip this. I want, I'd rather get rid of this than that because the engine's too big, it's not fuel efficient enough, it's a bit loud. So why don't we just bin the pair of them? Because you're so assertive. So it's down to three. So three cars remain in our 10 grand car challenge. Join us later when we poke and prod the Kia, Toyota and VW to decide which has the best style, space and build quality and find out which two will progress to the final part of the test, the drive-off. Now it's time for us to get a first look and first drive of a brand new model. <laughs> yes, it's the fifth year team test. Today the team tested the BMW X7. The X7 is the biggest BMW ever made. It's 5.15 metres long, it weighs 2.3 tonnes and it's their latest model to rival large premium 4x4s like the Range Rover and the Mercedes GLS. Prices start at £72,000, but we've got the M50D, which is priced at eighty-five grand. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Open BMW. Yeah, you don't like Open it, do you? Eyes. But X7. Don't be, don't be like that. What? I think it's lush. What? Do you like it? I really like it, but I love it's it because it's uh, because of its ugliness. I think he's off his head. I, I think it's great. Oh, but look at this. Mm. I'm not going around. Why not? Why not? Because I've seen that. Because I've seen I've seen the pictures of it, <laughs> and I, I don't know if I can take it. Oh my gosh! What's wrong There's with nothing you? subtle about it's this car. It's just bad Photoshop no. made real. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to be seen dead in it. <laughs> it's BMW's design department needing to be sacked. It's everything that I don't like about the car industry, wrapped up in one... But, John, you've got what? a family. How practical is this? It's not practical, because look at the size of it. Johnny, well, Johnny's got no taste, has he? Jeez. Look, little open tailgate. This is... Look, I love a tailgate that flaps down. I think it's really I mean, I can lush. tell it's built well. Have you seen the gear shifter? No. Do you remember the crystal maze? Yeah, well, I love that. Get in. Are you get in there. Oh, 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 oh get out. <laughs> yeah. A cut glass gear knob. Will that dazzle you? It is actually dazzling. Sometimes my rock gets dazzling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's, it, what's in the, your big scoop ahead of the gear knob? You can cool or heat the cup holders. Look, and, yeah, and you've it. even got LEDs to represent the temperature. <laughs> Never seen that before, and I'm lusting after one. So do you think a car like this needs a big key? Well, it, it seems to need a big everything. Oh, my. Whoa. That is the size of... I used to have a Motorola V50 clamshell. <laughs> yeah, that's the size of it a Motorola like V50. You can actually park the car, start the car, and you can drive the car out of a parking space if, if it's someone what else. What was this? Yeah. Uh, I genuinely wasn't bothered about driving it. So, Jason went first. Here's an interesting thing with the old X7. Four turbos. Wow. It's Is got, it really? It's got four turbos. I'll tell you what, it's quite wafty, isn't it? Two and a half tons, man. 0 to 62, 5.4 seconds. No. Yeah. It really can't be. <laughs> Is it? 
Do you? I want one even more. <laughs> Do you? Driving, this is as luxurious as a range. Yeah, without a doubt. I would be more comfortable in a Range Rover. Really? Yeah. Do you want to swap? Yeah. It's rapidly going downhill in my books. Yay! Wow. Do you know what it was lacking? Opulence. It was starting to become two against one as Vicky was questioning the luxury in the back you'd expect from an 80 grand car. So she got behind the wheel. At city speed, which is what we're reenacting here, Nice and nimble, steering's light, got a good lock on it. This is definitely the better place to be, I th Don't think. think. Yeah. yeah. Johnny, yeah, yeah, yeah. you fancy a go now? Have, I, have we whetted your appetite enough? No, I'm pretty dry, to be honest. Come uh, on, Johnny. OK, all right. Yeah. Taste it, taste well, it. In the name of journalism, yeah. I will do it. Or okay. don't close your mind. As the X7 has four-wheel drive and BMW claim it has generous ground clearance, I decided we should head to the off-road track. So you're enjoying it, aren't you? No. I'd like to think that Johnny slightly warmed towards it, but you know what he's like. Oh, I don't like SUVs. Yeah. Cars of this worth, when are you ever going to risk taking them off-road? Because you go, well, if I smack the front bumper, that's four grand. Go on, you fighter. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag not my car. <laughs> It's been tested on and off-road, so what are the scores for BMW's super-sized four-wheel drive? Never going to live this down with one Mr J Smith, but anyway, I'm going to give it a nine. I think the BMW X7 is a vulgar vehicle that doesn't really need to exist. And on that basis, although it's well-made, I'm going to give it that a two. I don't want to ever see one on the road. The more I was in it, the less I liked it. So I'm going to give it an OK-ish 7. So, despite me not being the biggest fan, the BMW X7 gets a pretty decent team test score of 18 out of 30. Join us after the break when Vicky gets excited about dropping off the kids in Lamborghini's super SUV, the Urus. I will be queen of the school mums in this. And Johnny and I continue our mission to find the best new car for a paltry 10 grand. That is great. I love that. The car world has gone SUV mad, and it seems that every five minutes another new model pops up. However, it's not just the bread and butter manufacturers who've cottoned on to these high riding family carryalls, but the luxury brands too. Bentley, Jaguar, Porsche, and Rolls Royce now all produce monster SUVs with price tags around, or in some cases well beyond, £100,000. Even Ferrari and Aston Martin are making moves to join the gang. But to find the origins of the super SUV, we have to go back to the 80s. This is the first ever supercar SUV, the Lamborghini LM002. It broke cover in 1986 and drew attention, not just for its bonkers looks, but the 5.2-litre V12 Countach engine Lambo shoved under the bonnet. Amongst the owners were 80s legends Tina Turner and Sylvester Stallone, the latter giving this car its nickname, the Rambo Lambo. With its combination of ride height, four-wheel drive, prestigious badge and monstrously powerful engine, the Rambo Lambo had all the credentials of a super SUV. But sadly, the car's military-style looks and off-road emphasis did not tick enough boxes with wealthy car buyers. And after selling just 323 of them, Lambo pulled the plug in 1993. But the luxury SUV seed had been planted. 25 years after that landmark car, Lambo have returned to the super SUV club they started with this, the Urus. It is a far cry from the LM002, not least because the only battlefield this will be on is the school run. It is layered with luxury. These beautifully embossed leather seats, the Alcantara roof, brushed aluminium trim, jet fighter style starting arrangement, and the twin haptic touch screens. All of it makes it feel as though you're in a sumptuous SUV. But is it a supercar? Well, it certainly looks the part. The Urus has got an extravagant, razor-sharp exterior that only Lamborghini could get away with. No other SUV looks like this. But can this £160,000 beast hack it as a daily driver? 
In terms of space, yes. The Urus has got a bigger boot than its competitors, the Bentley Bentayga and Rolls-Royce Cullinan. And it'll do 23 miles to the gallon, or 400 miles per tank. It achieves that level of fuel efficiency because the engine shuts down four of its eight cylinders when pottering around under 3,000 revs. So much for the practicalities. What I really want to know is, does this car still qualify as a proper Lambo? Well, Lamborghini is part of the VW stable, and so it shares the platform with the Porsche Cayenne, one of the best handling SUVs out there. And then there's the engine, a four litre V8 with 650 horsepower that propels it to 62 miles an hour in 3.6 seconds. Not bad for a car that weighs 2.2 tonnes. That is supercar quick. It's quicker than the Bentley and Rolls-Royce rivals. This car is capable of 190 miles an hour, so Lamborghini made sure they did not skimp on the brakes. And the carbon ceramic setup are the world's largest on a production car. Oh, when you lift off the throttle and it goes pa 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 pa. Oh, that is so lovely. The only downside is the firm ride, which might not quite be to your children's liking in the back. Who cares about them when Mummy is having so much fun up front? It is remarkable that Lamborghini have re-entered the SUV market, but they have. And this car has more of a wow factor than the Rolls-Royce or Bentley. Every journey you will make in this car will be an experience, whether it's pottering through town or out for a country blast or a long motorway cruise, it is an experience. And when it comes to the morning kids run, I will be queen of the school mums in this. Welcome back. Johnny and I are returning to our Mission Impossible to find a 10 grand new car that's actually well made and fun to drive. We started with six cars, and following our speed dating test drive, the Dacia Sandero and the Fiat Panda were eliminated because of their uncomfortable rides. And we ditched the MG3 for being too thirsty. Which leaves us with the VW Up, Toyota Igo, and Kia Picanto. Now it's time to dig a bit deeper. OK, we've got to decide whether we like the style of them how well they're made mm -hmm. and how much space they've got in them. Because, frankly, all that stuff is vital if you're going to live with it on a daily basis. I reckon we could call this the lifestyle test. You're a visionary. You need a clipboard. OK. And you need a pen. <laughs> Fantastic. We're going to mark them out of five in three categories, space, style and finish. The two cars with the highest marks will then go head-to-head -head in the finale, when I'll be pushing them to the limits on the track. All right, look, as we're sat in it, Let's start with Picanto. The boot in this is the biggest out of our three survivors. How much is that in size? 255 litres with the seats up. Over 1,000 with the seats down. Quite a deep well. I like it, actually. But well, do you know what? You get your week shopping in here easy, wouldn't, wouldn't you? OK. And it doesn't come at the detriment of space in the back, where the Kia can seat three people. It's all right. Not touching the roof. What are we going to score it out of five? Four. Four, I reckon. Space-wise, then, four out of five. Style next, please. Well, it's not a bad looking car, no, is it? It's got the, the, the lovely tiger nose, Kia grille. I think the back is nice in the front for sure. Do you not think? No, it's a bit concave. I would probably give it about a three out of five. I, th I think three's fair. Fit and finish. Let's sit in the cabin. Okay. This looks like you're sitting in a bigger car than you really are. This is all very mature and I like it. I don't know why. I like that wheel. It's uh, not fussy. No. It's quite sporty. It I quite is. like that. Yes, I like it as well. It's not bad. It's just a bit boring. Sensible. So what are we going to score it? Three? Three and a half? Do you know what? The quality's all right, isn't it? Yes. Let, let's do three and a half. Ten. Right. Three and a half. Out of 15. That's not bad. So the Kia kicks things off with a respectable ten and a half out of 15. On to the Toyota. Right, I go. So this is the smallest boot out of the three. 168 litres. Seats down, 812 litres. It's not big, though, is it? Mm. Let's check the uh, rear seats. Now, there's one thing that you immediately notice. You can't wind the back windows down. Oh, I don't like that. Pop-outs, money-saving exercise. It feels tighter than the Picanto to me. Do I look comfy? No, <laughs> no. 
Oh, no. This is nowhere near as good. No. And then JP noticed a crucial drawback compared to the five-seater Kia. There's no middle seat. So what are you thinking? Two and a half yeah. out of five. That's, it's, it's not that good, is it? Styling. It's got like an X-y face. I think, it, I think it works. The front works better than the back. The rear lights are a bit too bulbous. So what would you give that in terms of style? Four. Four out of five. Done. Finish. I think this is great in here. Yeah. You know, I quite like this big display at the front. It's in colour. Yeah. I would say this is better. Than the Picanto. Yeah. Well, I'd I... say it's more funky, design-wise, but build quality, no. Oh, see, I think this is better. Three and a half out of five. Do you think? Right, total score then for the iGo. 10 out of 15, Picanto, 10 oh, and a half man. out of 15. Last one, first one we drove up. The Kia currently leads our lifestyle contest, but VWs are renowned for their build quality and classy styling. That is 251 litres. Which is only a fraction smaller than the Kia, and at 951 litres with the seats down, means it's also just behind the Korean car. Immediately, it just feels better put together. Solid. Than, yeah. Oh, I do like See, that. now even when that closes, that's a proper, a proper closing yeah, noise, isn't it? Yeah. Ah, still same windows. Pop outs. Oh, hang on. Still only four seats. Then. Four seats only. But what do you notice compared to the iGo? It's much bigger. It's way more airy, the roof shape, everything. I think it's about the same as the Picanto. Well, I think it's more. So the Picanto's four out of five for space. Yeah. OK, so four and a half. Yeah? Yeah. So what about styling? For me, it just looks like a properly made, yeah. thought-out car. It's quality, isn't it? Are we going to give it a five out of five? No, it's not possible. It's not perfect. So 4.75? I know that's going to make the adding up hard. <laughs> just go for four and a half, I reckon. Four and a half out of five. On to the fit and finish. What's this for here? This is so that instead of wasting your time with a big sat nav screen that goes out of date, you can just put your phone in there. Oh, there you go. That is great. I love that. Lovely steering wheel, lovely clocks. This is a different league, isn't it? Up gets four. And a half. It's got a traditional Volkswagen quality feel. Yeah, it does. Four and a half, four and a half, four and a half. 13.5. Time to sum up our lifestyle test. The scores are in. The VW Up's a clear winner. Yeah. Space, style and finish, it wins. Well, the iGo's got to go. The iGo's got to go. Which leaves us with the VW Up and the Kia Picanto. Now, it's all very well buying with your head, but will any of these stir your soul? And more importantly, will any of them give you any driving pleasure? Join us later in the programme as we take these two contenders on that Alpine circuit to see which one can bring out a grin. And crucially, which one is worthy of your hard-earned money? After the break, I'll also test out two load-carrying estates that have bags of pace. The Skoda Superb Sportline and the Volvo V90 T5. I mean, it's not a rocket ship, but it's not bad. And Jimmy is looking at a classic that revolutionised the supercar, the Honda NSX. It's naughty, but very, very nice all at the same time. <laughs> Now, let's have a shootout. That moment where we put two sporty numbers of similar price, performance and purpose on a track to see which is fastest. This time, we're testing two estates that combine pace with space and do it without breaking the bank. This is the Skoda Superb Sportline. It's the Czech manufacturer's biggest estate and has a tuned four-cylinder, two-litre turbo engine, which gets it a 62 in a brisk 5.6 seconds. It's pretty rapido. Prices start at 36 grand. And this mouthful is the Volvo V90 R Design Plus T5. 20 years ago, Volvo's T5 estate was the go-to vehicle for motorway cops, with its combination of speed and space. I used to love the old original T5 Volvo. The engine was great. It was a five-cylinder turbo. Sounded magnificent. Like the Skoda, the Volvo has a two-litre turbo engine, but it gets to 62 almost a second slower and costs 10 grand more. I'll begin with the Superb. Now, I'm sitting in the most powerful 
car that's going to produce. So I've got 272 brake horsepower, 350 newton metres of torque, and a grippy four-wheel drive system, which goes some way to explain its decent 0 to 62 time. I mean, this is a pretty big bus. It's 4.85 metres long. It weighs 1,650 kilograms, which, you know what, I don't think that's too bad for a, for a thing as big as this. Now, Skoda have lowered the ride height by about 15 millimetres to try and counteract the roll. So let's see what she's like in this little tight bus stop chicane. Bit of understeer, there's definitely roll there, for sure. There's quite a lot of turbo lag on this car. The gearbox is really sweet, brakes are sharp. Ah, I mean, it's not a rocket ship, but it's not bad. It's got a G-meter. What do you want one of them for? A G-force meter to show how many Gs a car can pull in the corners is usually more at home in high-performance cars or jet fighters. But anyway, let's see if we can get more than a G. Ah, just over a G. It's comfortable, it's refined, it's quiet. It's... Anyway, let's see how fast she goes. Time for a fast lap. Start the watch. Yeah, considering the length of the car, it's got quite good turn in. Yeah, oh, I want to get the back out, but he won't let me. Characteristic four-wheel drive understeer there on entry. Do you know what? I can't ever imagine thrashing an estate car. Well, it's quite good fun, actually. You need a big wagon. You could do a lot worse than this, in all honesty. It's pretty good, actually. The Skoda records a time of 50.19 seconds. Let's move on to the Volvo. So it's clear I stepped into a much more premium car, which is hardly surprising because this is going to cost you 10 grand more. And you know what? On paper, this is going to be slower than the Skoda. It's 20 horsepower down, so it's got 250 horsepower. It's a bit heavier, but it is front wheel drive, and that's probably the reason why the 0 62 time isn't as good. Now, we've got an eight-speed gearbox in here. Similar engine to the Skoda in that. It's a two-litre, four-cylinder turbocharged. Now, if you thought the Skoda was big, well, think again. This is, this is a very big car, you know. Best part of five metres long, and, you know, that's, that's Range Rover territory. It feels just too softly damped. It doesn't recover settle quickly enough, just for fun. Time for a fast lap. Start the watch. <laughs> Handling-wise, you know, we've got quite a lot of understeer. It's not as directional as a Skoda. At the first checkpoint, it's tantalisingly close, but surprisingly, the Volvo is just edging it. Quite a bit more disconnected from the car. You know, the steering's uber light. The suspension's very supple, almost a bit too soft, actually. Massively comfortable, luxurious, refined. I'd like a bit more performance, to be honest. A little bit more would be fun. At the second checkpoint, the tide has turned and the Volvo's power deficit means it's lost the lead, trading the Skoda by half a second. Yeah, there's quite a lot of electronic interference. The car's constantly tinkering with the brakes in the corner. It's a nice place to be, but it ain't sporty. Stop the watch. The Volvo records a time of 51.05, losing to the Skoda by just under a second. So the Volvo hasn't quite retained its fast estate DNA from the 90s, 
And if you're in the market for an affordable estate that packs a punch, as well as a lot of luggage and passengers, the Skoda Superb Sportline should be on your list. Now it's over to our engineering wizard and custom car builder, Jimmy DeVille, who's lifting the bonnet of a modern motoring icon that significantly changed the way cars are now designed and built. For many years, supercars only came from a handful of manufacturers, like Lamborghini, Porsche and Aston Martin. In 1990, a new supercar exploded onto the scene, but it didn't have an Italian, German or British pedigree. This beast came from the East. Japan, to be precise. And amazingly, from the makers of the humble Civic, Honda. It was called the NSX, which stood for New Sports Car Experimental and was designed specifically to take on the Ferraris of the day, like the 348. Honda spared no expense in its development, and it's fair to say its space age design was unlike anything that had come from Japan before. The designers of this cabin wanted this space to feel like the cockpit of an American F-16 fighter plane. And that's why they created these beautiful thin A-pillars. And there's no C-pillars whatsoever. And it wasn't just the looks that impressed everyone. The car handled just as well as anything from Ferrari, thanks to the input of a motor racing legend. So the story goes is all down to one certain Mr. Senna, who just happened to be in Japan testing the Honda McLaren Formula One car when Honda asked him to take a little look at the NSX. And he suggested to them that they stiffen up this car by a whopping 50%. And that's what's given this car such an incredible ride. He loved it so much that he actually went on to own one. And I tell you what, Mr. Senna, you did a fantastic job. Woo -hoo -hoo! The NSX had a groundbreaking all alloy body and chassis, which made it nearly 200 kilos lighter than if it had been made of steel. But that's not what makes it an icon to me. For that, we have to go under the bonnet to the innovative variable valve engine, the Honda christened VTEC. The amount of fuel-air mixture that each cylinder receives is controlled by valves, which are opened and shut by rotating teardrop-shaped cams. On an engine that isn't a VTEC, you only have one size of cam pushing down on your rocker, and that'll only open or close the valve a set distance every time which is fine for normal driving and achieving good economy. But sometimes you want to get more fuel and air into the cylinder because more of that means more power. And that's where Honda's VTEC engine was revolutionary. So when it's working normally, the standard cams open and close my valves that short distance. But what the VTEC system does, it allows me to switch from the standard cams to the high lift cam, like that. This cam has now overtaken these cams and is gonna push my valves down or open them up more. That allows me to put more fuel and air into my cylinder, giving me a bigger bang. And it's that bigger bang that makes the NSX go like stink. So back in the car, it was time to properly open the taps. When that VTEC kicks in, this thing just comes alive. Oh, listen to that. <laughs> the exhaust note changes, the engine note changes, and it just pulls away. The NSX only has a three litre engine, but thanks to its clever technology, it produces 270 horsepower. And in a car that weighs just 1,370 kilos, that was enough to get it to 62 miles per hour in under six seconds. Which was only a shade slower than the 5.4 seconds it took the 3.4 litre Ferrari 348. 
The big difference was that thanks to Japanese manufacturing, the NSX was a car you could drive every day, and it was as reliable and easy to own as a Civic. It is just a symphony of beautifulness. There is a sort of high pitch, whirring, roaring, nastiness that is sophisticated, yet I think utterly, utterly beautiful. It's naughty, but very, very nice all at the same time. It just is great. What a car! VTEC technology meant you could have your cake and eat it, with an engine that could be more economical in normal driving and have serious performance when you wanted it. This was a proper technological leap that can now be found in cars as basic and everyday as a Honda Jazz. This car also felt the hand of Ayrton Senna, and that, in my book, makes this a true icon. After the break, hold on tight. Felt a bit of wee wee trying to come out then. <laughs> in the finale of our challenge to find the best 10 grand car in Britain, our final two cars are going head to head to find out which one is the most fun to drive. Will the VW or Kia take the crown? Welcome back to the final part of our hunt for a corking 10 grand car. We started with six contenders, but the ride quality of the Fiat Panda just wasn't good enough. That's very noisy, isn't it? It is quite loud. A lot of suspension noise coming up. And it was the first to be rejected. Next for the chop was the Dacia Sandero. Once again, poor ride quality was its downfall. The steering's quite crashy. Every little bump it jolts. The seats are not giving me a great deal of support. It's noisy. The MG3 felt like a more expensive car, and it had a more powerful engine. Significantly faster. But that meant it was less economical than the rest. Significantly worse emissions. And it had to go. Then the Toyota Igo was eliminated because it simply didn't cut the mustard on the lifestyle and design front. Do I look comfy? No. <laughs> no. Oh, no. This is nowhere near as good. No. Which leaves us with these two, the Kia Picanto and Volkswagen's Up. And it also leaves us with this empty test track, because now we want to find out how much fun they are to drive. Do they go fast and do they handle? It's at this point I hand over the keys to our professional touring car driver, Mr Jason Plato. Right, come on. Stopwatch at the ready, we're going to see which car can record the fastest lap time. We're starting with a Picanto. It's not all about that time. No, it's about the, the feel. Yeah, how does it feel? See, because I didn't drive this earlier, you did, didn't you? Yeah, I did, not I liked it. Right, it felt go. good. Let's go. Ooh. That feels neat. But the steering's I mean, got a good feel to it, it's relatively reactive. Most people will buy this car to do shopping. But if you're going to do shopping, you may as well do it quickly. Well, yeah. On the Alpine track, JP was clearly not holding back. I've got a grab handle and everything. <laughs> and I'm going to need it. And the Picanto seemed to be holding on as tight as Johnny. It's really good. It's hanging on on the front. But then, on the steeper uphill section, struggling a bit up here. Yeah, but yeah. actually, do you know what? It's a good little chassis. Yeah, it's quite well damped. Yeah, it's really well damped. Oh, yeah, there's not oh. too much roll in it. <laughs> did you go? Oh, yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. I just quivered. Despite my doubts about these ten grand cars, I was having a blast. I've got my tongue out. You know what that means? You're concentrating. Yeah, that means we're going to have a go round here. It's much more fun than I thought it was going to be. It, yeah. It is. You know, it's not too soft. No, it's not. That's a bit unnerving oh. around there, isn't it, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I, got, I felt a bit of wee-wee trying to come out then. <laughs> We've got to jump. Eh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> we got some air! I mean, we are in a real base model kind of car. And you're, you're enjoying <laughs> it. You're enjoying it. <laughs> Ready? Ready? Yeah. One minute, 56. I have to say, it oh, drives really oh, well. I thoroughly enjoyed that. It's good fun, isn't it? It's a good car. It's a really good little car. 
enjoyed that. <laughs> we really enjoyed that. The Kia's lap time was 1 minute 56 seconds. Will the VW up take it down? I have a hunch that this is not going to quite drive as well as the Bicanto for some reason. But this is an older car. I'm interested to see how close they are. I think I think it'll be closer than we think, actually. It's not as quick. It's nowhere near as, 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 as grunty, is it? It's not as responsive. The Volkswagen is 25 horsepower down on the Kia, and the deficit was obvious off the line. 95 Newton metres of torque. It's not a lot in today's money. I've just got to make it up on the corners, babes. Oh, I've got no grab handle either. <laughs> <laughs> and the little up was mightily impressive through the bends. Do you know what? I mean, it's a, it's a good drive. Oh, do you know what? It's got good grip. Yeah, we'll, it has. I think we'll go third through here. Really? Oh, you fighter. Oh, what was that? That, that was the old traction control giving it, you know, the stability. Oh, so was ABS. The traction control interference on the up felt like it was costing it time compared to the Kia. Oh, I never know where to turn in there. That's about right. Right, let's see what air we get. What oh, do you reckon? Oh. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Air. <laughs> Could have been we a definitely bounce. got some, didn't we? Got a bit of bounce from the landing. Oh, I thought it was going in that fast. <laughs> I thought I was going to give that a little kiss then. Hey, 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 hey. Um, stop the watch. It's slower. It is slower. The Volkswagen Up lapped the circuit in just over two minutes, three seconds. That's a full seven seconds slower than the Kia Picanto. This feels a better engineered car, it feels more quality. Yeah. But that's more fun to drive than this. It's very close. It's tough, this. This whole test is tough from the start. It just goes to show that even Bottom of the pecking order, cars can be brilliant. So after the final round of our 10 grand car showdown, the Kia Picanto was the fastest around the Alpine circuit and a much more fun car to drive. It oh, drives really well. I thoroughly enjoyed that. But the VW's superior build quality makes it a better car to live with every day. However, there can only be one winner. <laughs> interesting day. Really interesting. Close. I can't believe how they can make a car as good as this yeah. for the money. Well, and they can make a car like this with a seven-year warranty for the money. It kind of makes you think we're paying a bit over the top for the other stuff. Totally. Yeah. We're down to the final two, and it's really, really difficult. This is a surprisingly entertaining car. I know it is. That was arguably more fun to yeah. drive, but if you look at everything and you have to live with them every single day, this, this for me is a clear winner. Yeah, I think that just edges it because I like the, ultimately, I like the style. But both are extremely practical and entertaining, actually. So today you turned up thinking you were going to drive six rubbish, cheap cars. Yes, I did. And do you know what? Hands up. Uh, yeah, I'm wrong. Yeah. And it's been a close run race, but that, the VW Up, I think, edges it. It's our favourite.